Uh, so Manny and I had a really cool conversation yesterday. I'm not sure if you guys have heard, but Manny uh, and Teresa are in the process of moving into their first single family house, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm fascinated by how they're approaching this move. Uh, because while it would be so easy to just sign a lease, take all your stuff to a new place and start living in it, they see an important opportunity to begin or to move all of your stuff from one place to another is an opportunity for a new beginning. It, it's a chance to start over, um, to start fresh in a variety of ways. And that's what, exactly what Manny and Teresa are talking about. They have this sense that, that through the years that they've been in their current place, their family has settled into uh, some, some lifestyle habits that they're not super excited about. But it's been hard, right? And we know this feeling. It can be hard to break free from habits while you're still living in the same space. But now they see this chance for a clean break, a fresh start. And, and so they're busy naming some new habits that they want to take on. And they're teaching their kids that as a family, they're, they're taking on a new way of life. And, and part of this process is saying goodbye to some old habits and some old stuff, which they did yesterday as they took a massive load to the dump. And as Manny told me about the way that he and Teresa are approaching this move, he described the change that they are creating as a change in culture. Like they want a new culture in their home. Do you know this is exactly what the book of Leviticus is all about? God is taking his people from a life of slavery in Egypt to a life of freedom in the land that he promised them. But their old way of life is completely incompatible with this new home that God is providing them. And they need to learn a radically new way of life. They need a new culture. And Leviticus offers them that culture. Think about your technology phones or computers, right? Periodically, your devices need uh, minor upgrades uh, and we'll go from version 12.1 to 12.2. This might fix some minor bugs you won't even notice, but then sometimes it's, it's a much bigger upgrade and you'll jump from version 12 to version 13. Uh, there might be a new interface you have to get used to and usually you'll need to learn maybe some, new, some of the newest features but then sometimes you'll make a move so big that you have to fundamentally change how you use your device. Uh, last week, my dad tried to push Becca uh, in a pool and he drastically underestimated both how strong and quick she is. And before he knew it, uh, he was in the water with her phone and all. So for a couple of days, I got to watch my old dad try to transition from an iPhone 6 to an 11. Uh, it's a huge jump, learning how to use a phone that doesn't have a home button. It was awesome. But the change we're talking about is even bigger than that. Can you remember going from a landline to a cell phone? Can you remember going from a flip phone to a smartphone. For some of us, that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> Penny Dick. <laughs> there it is, right? If you, if you really think about it, right, like you would remember some of the massive changes you went through personally but also that like we went through as, a, as, as our culture changed. Recently, I saw news uh, that the last payphone in New York City was removed. Until I graduated high school, I would carry two quarters with me everywhere I went all the time in case I needed to call home for a ride. It's been said. <laughs> I know, I'm so young. <laughs> It's been said that two technological innovations changed the American neighborhood into what we mostly experience today. First, the television set, but by itself, the set 
the TV wasn't enough to draw people out of their neighborhoods and into their living rooms. It was only once the average household also had air conditioning that people moved from hanging out on their front porches in the evening to gathering around a TV as a single family in their living rooms. This was a massive cultural change. But what is this cultural shift that God is leading his people through? And how does it all work? That is what Leviticus is all about. And chapters 18 through 20 are in many ways the heart of it. Although the entire book of Leviticus is part of this project, but it's here in these chapters that we find Yahweh doing two distinct things that are really important. The first thing that Yahweh is doing is he is giving his people distinctive customs. So if, like you're taking note, it, it might be helpful to keep this language in your head. Distinctive customs. He is setting them apart with a unique lifestyle. And the second thing that Yahweh is doing is he's giving his people a holy character. He is setting them apart with a rich uh, substance. So customs and character, style and substance. And, and let me just show you how this works. So if you've got your Bibles open, Leviticus 19, right in the middle of chapter 19, verse 19, we read, you shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You guys all got that? You're not going to let your cattle breed with a different kind? You shall not sow your field with the two kinds of seed. Feeling super relevant here. Not shall you wear... Uh, nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. And nobody check your, your shirt tags right now. What, what do you notice? No mixing of cattle, no mixing of seeds, no mixing of fabrics. These statutes are essentially cosmetic customs. They are focused on style, not substance. None of these statutes has any moral weight to them, right? A, a garment of a single material isn't morally, ethically better. It's not more good than a garment made up of multiple fabrics. Yahweh is giving his people customs that will make them look strange, weird, distinct among their very specific neighbors who have their own cultural practices. But Yahweh isn't interested only in customs. He also gives his people commands that should make them even more strange. See, because they won't just look strange with customs, but they will be a strange people in their very essence and the way that they think in what they desire. So scan kind of back up your page, just a, a few verses. Uh, chapter 19, verse 17. We read, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. Okay, so what do you notice in this one? Yahweh is concerned with the condition of his people's hearts. Right? They are to be a certain kind of people. They do not seek revenge. They do not hold grudges. And Yahweh goes on to contrast these prohibitions with an alternative, a positive vision for life, rather than hate, rather than seek revenge, rather than hold grudges, you all should love your neighbor as yourself. And this should sound familiar to you, right? Because when Jesus is asked the greatest commandment, Jesus takes this single line from Leviticus. The, the greatest commandment comes from Leviticus. And he connects it with love. Yahweh, your God, with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus adds, and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, 
Yahweh is giving his people a distinctive culture. But more important, he is giving them a holy character. He is giving them a particular lifestyle, but he is far more interested in their particular um, life substance. And if you make your way through these chapters, you will see an, an overwhelming amount of substance. Some of it's just a, a direct repeat of the Ten Commandments, what they got at Mount Sinai at the very beginning. God's people don't steal. God's people don't lie about each other. And they show honor to their parents. But some of it gets a lot more specific than that. And we just read through a, a little bit of an overview, a summary of what's in there. I don't want to necessarily get into the, the specifics this morning because what I want to do is I, I want to help you read these chapters for yourself, really understanding what God is saying, what God's heart is, and how, how they might speak to us today as words from God. To say that Leviticus is still scripture for God's people in a very different time and place. I actually think that these three chapters, 18, 19, and 20, make up one of the most profound and easily the most practical uh, passages in the whole Bible. And I think if you would spend some time meditating on this passage, um, maybe a little bit each day, whatever form you do, uh, maybe memorize it, uh, you would find your life being transformed in some significant ways. So if I want to help you uh, read it well, um, I have a tool, um, one more tool to help you sort of make sense of what's going on here. Yahweh tells us explicitly in this passage that he's doing two things. So notice the very beginning of our passage, what Carrie read for us earlier, starting in chapter 18, verse 3, we hear, you shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. Okay, first thing God does is make his people look different from their surrounding neighbors. Think of Israel's diet. This would have made them culturally different than their neighbors. Think of the Israelites' clothes and calendar. These would have made them culturally different from their neighbors. Think of the Israelites' categories of what's clean and unclean. All of these customs were designed to make the Israelites stand out visibly as a distinct people. We, we probably could come up with a, a bunch of immediate examples in the United States of groups that stand out because of their distinct customs. The Amish. In the 60s and 70s, you had the hippies. At, at my kid's school, there are students who wear distinctive head coverings. Students who, who fast at particular times of the year and who celebrate distinct holidays. This is what Yahweh was doing for Israel. He was making them stand out visibly in the ancient world among other peoples. But then there's one other thing that Yahweh is doing. And we hear it most clearly in two passages. Leviticus 19, chapter, uh, verse 2, Yahweh says, You shall be holy, for I, Yahweh, your God, am holy. And then flip over to chapter 20, verse 7. And here we read, Make yourselves holy, therefore, and be holy. For I am Yahweh your God. Keep my statutes and do them. I am Yahweh who makes you holy. So, if part of our passage is about how the Israelites were to look different from their neighbors, then the other part of our passage is about how the Israelites are supposed to look like God. 
specifically the God who rescued them from slavery. So they're not supposed to look like their neighbors and they're supposed to look like God. This is basically what, what all of these chapters are about. Don't look like your neighbors, look like God. The problem is one of the difficulties for us in reading this is those two things aren't necessarily the same thing. So you can look different from your culture and still not look like God. For instance, do you believe that the father is wearing a garment of only a single, right? Like this is not a, a command, a statute that actually tells us something about what God is like, but it's a custom. Here's how, uh, here's how this plays out. I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, from our own church tradition. We're part of a denomination called the Church of the Nazarene. Part of the culture of the Church of the Nazarene is a custom of abstaining from alcohol. The Church of the Nazarene has historically opposed drinking any alcohol. In the beginning, in the inner city where Phineas Brzee was trying to bring God's life and restoration in the midst of rampant alcoholism, where alcohol was tearing apart families and the social fabric of the community. Brzee wanted the church to be a people of holy love, people who would set aside their freedom to drink, choosing not to, so that those who needed safety, those who needed a, a healing community could find it in this new family. What, what an incredible vision. We see God's character just oozing out of that. We see Yahweh's mercy and, and we see his compassion. We see his a care for others. God's love for the neighbor is present in this rejection of alcohol. God forming a holy culture marked by his holy character. But if you know anything about our tradition over time, drinking takes a bit of a shift from being about character to being about um, being different. It, it becomes little more than a cultural custom for many, a way to show that we're different from our neighbors. And sometimes even other churches, we don't drink like those other people who drink and it quickly becomes about style, appearance, and it can and has often become a source of pride rather than an impulse to love. This distinction between customs versus character, style versus substance, looking different from our neighbors versus looking holy like God. These distinctions are actually one of the biggest obstacles to our reading this passage well, because our passage, Leviticus, is filled with both customs and character. But I wanna suggest for you, and this is a bold claim, and I'm telling you, feel free to test it, and let's like wrestle this out, but, but I want to suggest that God's will for his church is this, that we give up cultural customs as signs of faith. That we abandon them, that we give up cultural customs as signs of faith, instead focusing only on the fruit that comes from abiding in Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit. God's will is that we would be made holy, holy in love, holy in God's character, holy as he is holy. From beginning to end of the scriptures, one thing is clear. God wants to make us, you, me, all of us, to be like himself. But we face this massive problem as the story of scripture unfolds. Becoming like God can only happen in one place. One place in proximity to God. We become like God when we are with him. And that's the only place. Like Moses on the mountain, he comes down glowing, radiating, having been with Yahweh. But then you have Adam and Eve who hide from God. 
The Israelites in the wilderness, they stand back from God on the mountain. They make sacrifices outside of the camp, even though God is right in the middle of their camp saying, come and be and live in my presence. The dilemma is this, that God's people, called by God, rescued by God again and again, don't actually want to be near God. They can talk about God. Uh, they can do things that God has asked. But coming near God is terrifying. They don't trust him. They trust others. It, there's, a, there's a million reasons. And therefore, if they cannot come before God, they cannot be holy as Yahweh is holy. Which is why Yahweh then, here in Leviticus, gives them a concession. Yahweh makes it easier for them. He gives them easier ways to be and live set apart. Diet and special holidays and dress, these can be adopted without a heart change. These are easy. In the big scope of life, nobody, nobody handles change well, but these are on the easier side of the scale. The bigger thing is these don't require God's presence. Anybody can adopt them. They, they might change the outside part of our lives, but there is no internal change required. But God wants his people to have his holy character. But he settles for a people with distinct customs. And he does it for a very particular reason in the story, so that he could preserve his people. His people, until the appointed time when Yahweh himself would come through them, would be born through them. Yahweh used these distinct customs to preserve the Israelites so that he could come through them take on flesh, demonstrate holy love lived in human flesh, holy love that suffers and dies, and holy love that can't be conquered by death. See, through these people that he is committed to preserving because he has put his name on them, Yahweh, he would come and he would save these very people from their fearful and untrusting hearts. He would give them new hearts and, the, and they would finally begin to draw near to him. And that's what we see in the, in, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter two, as the people are repenting, these are Israelites who have had hard and fearful hearts, who have been untrusting and they, they, their hearts are open. They see for the first time their God in front of them and they come near. But they don't just draw near to God because when you've been in God's presence, when you are close to God, when you are, are so overwhelmed and overcome by the love of this holy God who created everything, it is too much love for any of us to contain. It's a ridiculous amount of love and you just have to give it to others. And so if you have been in God's holy presence, you can't stay there. And so God's people, they begin to open up God's family to their neighbors, to foreigners, to their former enemies. And something, something had to change then. The Israelites' customs helped them survive for, for more than a thousand years as a people. But think about this. If God is now making one family, our kids know, as we read the Apostles' Creed together, one family made up of every tribe, tongue, and nation, Israelite and Gentile, this family can no longer be built around Israel's distinct customs or any cultural customs. Because people from every culture are flooding into this new family. And so Jesus does stuff like declare all food clean. 
Paul makes clear that Gentile converts are not required to become Jewish in custom. They don't have to be circumcised or follow the holidays or any of those things. And G Jewish followers of Jesus aren't required to abandon their Jewish customs. They're not required to become like the Gentiles. See, there's one thing that doesn't disappear in God's one expansive growing family. What becomes expected of every single member of God's family is that Yahweh's holy character would be formed in each of us. That's it. For every one of us, that's God's will for your life, that God's character would be formed in you and us. If I'm candid, it's way easier to form a community and build a community around shared customs, around shared cultural interests, around a shared style of music, around shared life experience. It's one of the reasons why churches in America have often settled for style over substance. Uh, if you truly want to understand why our neighbor, not necessarily our, the church's neighbors, wherever the church finds itself, right, think that the church is completely irrelevant to their lives. It's because the character of the churches could hardly be called holy. Not as God, as Yahweh is holy. Like the Israelites in the wilderness, and we can get really excited about, about building projects and exciting causes, doing things for God, rallying together, but when it, when it comes time to actually walk with Jesus, to be with him and do what he asks, we are too often found to be just taking care of our own lives, providing for ourselves outside of the camp, protecting ourselves with our own means. So what do we do about this? How do we respond? What, what is God asking of us? It's really e easy. It's really simple. Like three chapters all summarized in this one way. Just be holy. Be holy. So be holy. Now, if you hear me calling you to get to work changing our church culture to be more holy, you've misheard everything I've said this morning. There is only one way to make ourselves holy. It's to be with the one who is holy and to take who we are becoming in his presence out into the world as we live, into our relationships with our neighbors, with foreigners, and with our enemies. And so let's come together. Let's hear the Holy One inviting us into his holy presence for a holy meal at his holy table Our team's going to come, and we're going to respond, and we're going to open our hearts and our minds to the fact that our God, the holy God who made it all, is here with us right now and is inviting us to simply enjoy who he is, to see him in his glory, in his goodness. He's merciful and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He loves to forgive.